Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Because we have a choice. Isn't it amazing that we have a choice? How many people throw that choice away? We have the power to choose. You know, we have, a po we have the power to do God's will. That's all we got to do is ask. <laughs> you know, in everything that we do, one of the main purposes, you know, we were rescued not to do something for God, not, not that that's not a part of it. But we were rescued that we might know him. And his desire is that we know him. That, that's the number one thing so that, you know, so many people go want to be a servant of the Lord without being a son or daughter. Amen. And, you know, one of the things God wants us to be is his son. He wants to be the father that we could never have had. He wants us to be the father, the perfect father. To me and you. You know, we have fathers, but all man is messed up. All humanites, hybrids, contaminated genes, we're all a mess out there. But only in Christ can we change, and things can be altered and changed by the Creator. And the Creator that made me and you wants to be such a father to us that we're always looking in the arena of what he can do for us instead of knowing him. You know, many people go to God when they're in trouble. <laughs> and, and, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. Because sometimes it's not until we hit the wall of reality that we realize we're in trouble that we need help other than man. <laughs> man can't get me out of this one. <laughs> man can't change me. See, so God is always waiting for us. Always. But the first thing, again, he wants to be is a father. And when we come to that arena, that's called building a relationship. He desires that we build a relationship. And I think so many times that we begin to lose sight of that. We begin to start trying to serve God instead of maintaining that relationship with him. And, and works without relationship is dead. That means people are trying to work by building a relationship, and that's not what God is asking for. We build relationships. Something that Jesus asked his disciples, would you go to Mark's, Matthew 16? And I think sometimes we get caught up in serving and begin to drift from relationship. In Matthew 16 and verse 13, are you there? Let's speak it together. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words, he's saying, What do people say about me? You know, because there's a lot of people that say a lot of things about Jesus. There's a lot of things written about Jesus. But now he was wanting to bring it a little bit closer. And, and they said to him, some, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Jesus responded and he said, but who do you say I am? In other words, he invited everyone to know him. Who do you say I am? I, it doesn't matter what others say. In other words, I'm not looking at others' experiences with me. 
I'm looking at yours. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now I want you to understand something, that this revelation did not come to Peter without Peter doing some things first. Simon Barjona, Bar known as Peter. In this, you got to remember, Jesus walked by them and called them, and they accepted the call. They followed him. They began to see what he was like. They began to hear his words. They began to sit in his presence. There was something about Peter that the father revealed to Peter more than others at that time. And you got to remember that he was tough. Peter was tough, man. He was rough. He was bold. He was crazy, man. He challenged. He was rebellious. He made a lot of mistakes. He said a lot of things he shouldn't have. But he didn't give up seeking. There was something about Jesus that he wanted him more of. He believed him. He didn't understand him, but he believed him. And in that, God, the Father, revealed to Simon Barjona a revelation to him, a deeper understanding of a deeper relationship of who Jesus was. He got more of an understanding. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, he heard from the third dimension. Has everybody got that? A third dimensional language spoke to the Simon Barjona, Peter. And Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this revelation, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus stated something very powerful and said, I'm going to build my church on relationship, which will be built because you know that I am the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. In other words, the church will be built on the anointing and knowing the anointing, because when you know the anointing, you know Jesus. Again, building a relationship, you know, you got to ask yourself, do I really know him? And if you don't really know him, do you want to know him? You know, there's a cost of everything. Are you willing to pay the price? There must be a desire to want to know him. In fact, no man comes to him unless he's drawn. So if there's any inclination at all that you want to know who he is, it's because God is drawing us. And there's a place where he wants to build a relationship, and sometimes it just starts by discipline, being consistent. Listen, you don't know how to drive a car unless you practice it. And then all of a sudden, that discipline will lead to a relationship, and a relationship will lead to a love affair and intimacy. But there are certain guidelines and certain things that we do to build this relationship. The first thing, when you want to build a relationship, you want references. And that's called knowledge. It's called the Bible. The Gospels are vital about knowing who Jesus is. One of the second things we want is communication, and we do that by prayer. You know, you're talking about an eternal God that holds all things, who reigns in the third dimension, 
and holds everything in himself. There's a place that he wants me and you to get to. There's an area that he doesn't dwell with sin. He doesn't associate with evil. He exposes it. He's against it. There's, so there's a place where you and I got to humble ourselves and ask his forgiveness. He's not the God of feeling. Too many build their relationship with the one that made them by emotional relationship, by how they feel. You'll never know him then. Because you, you, your emotions will be your, your God instead of him being God. In prayer. So one of the things we do also with prayer is we speak. So there's an area where you and I must begin to sow so we can reap. So if you're speaking light, light is beginning to form before you. You're building a path. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? So when we're speaking eternal words, what we speak is what we eat, what we eat is what we become. So we're actually moving the powers of darkness, the spirits of unbelief, the spirits of rebellion, the spirits of fear. We're beginning to move certain things that are influencing us, lust and all the things of the world. As we begin to sow more and more and more, we're beginning to push back the other areas of darkness and allowing the presence of God to come and begin to reveal himself to us. See, we we're preparing a place for him to come, just like you go before a king. When you go before a king, you just don't show up. Hey, I'm here. There's a preparation for it. When the, when the king's wife comes before the king, there's a preparation. And even she can't even come in unless he extends his scepter to say, I approve, come. Does everybody understand? So in this, there's a preparation that God wants us to be prepared to come all the time, unlimited. And there's an understanding that we have that not only did Jesus pay the price for me and you to access that realm. So as you and I are sowing, we're reaping. So he's opening the door. So there's something that you and I must do, cooperate. You know, people are waiting on God, and God is waiting on his people. That's why first thing in the morning, acknowledge. Get dressed with the full armor of God. There's a war going on out there. So in this area of communication, there is prayer. So we got references and knowledge through his word. We got communication and prayer. We got sowing and reaping. Then there comes a place where... There's intimacy. Now, the world looks at intimacy as sexual. But the intimacy with God is communication. It's experience. It's spending time. That's intimacy. It's a desire. Do you want to know him? You can't even have that desire unless he gave it to you. Then there's a place where we love. See, we've all been known as love is lust. In the world, love is lust. Does everybody get it? I mean, there's, there is, there's a desire. Now, now listen. God's love is long-suffering. Why don't we go to 1 Corinthians 13 and look at what God's love is? Hallelujah. Is everybody there? In verse 4. Let's start at verse 4. What's it say? Love what? Suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love 
never fails. This is God's love. It said nothing about a feeling. I didn't see one thing here that said anything about feeling. Love is a choice, not a feeling. And too many people are building their, trying to build a relationship with God by how they feel instead of truth. So we have here references, knowledge, his word, communication in prayer, and sowing and reaping, intimacy where there's a desire. It's a love. You begin to experience, God begins to reveal things to you and you begin to experience certain things with him. And then there's an area of trust. Trust. Trust what? That you are in his covenant and promises. Trust. You know, you can't trust someone that can't trust you. So there's that place where trust is earned. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three and verse nine. Let's speak it together. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed in how he builds. He's talking about building a relationship with him. He said, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you if anyone defiles the temple of God God will destroy him for the temple of God is holy which temple you are let no one deceive himself if any among you seems to be wise in this age let him become a fool that he may become wise for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And the God, again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Again, we talk about the wisdom of the world. He's saying, I want you to have my wisdom. Why? Because it's going to come through relationship. Is everybody okay? So a foundational building is the area where God is building a relationship where you and I must be careful what we're building a relationship on because people begin to build a relationship with the Lord and how much God provides for them. And then when he doesn't give them what they want, the, the relationship is dropped. So again, he's not the God of just provision and he's not the God of just feeling. He is the God of truth. And it desires that me and you know the truth. And the more that we put the truth into practice, the more we change and the more we earn his trust. See, what he does is he does this. It's very powerful. Because the word says that his promises come after you do the will of God. So when, you, when he asks you to do something, you do it. He releases his promise. So many people want the promise before they do anything. So disobedience will not release the promise. Obedience does. And he wants you and I to have it all. He doesn't want to hold anything back from us. He wants us to have it all. Why? Because then we'll be assigning one or two of those in the world. Carrying his presence. Having the riches of knowledge and understanding. 
in 2 Peter chapter 1. But many times, we as believers fall back into that arena. And how we feel and provision instead of truth. In verse 2, chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power is what? Given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So his divine power is already being released to me and you. That's all we got to do is cooperate with it. Listen, you may want to go somewhere and a cab comes to pick you up, but you can choose not to get in the cab. Amen. Amen. Oh, man, why ain't I there yet? Because you didn't get your blessed assurance in the car. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, through the knowledge, knowing him, through his word, through his promises. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be what? Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Through lust. So it's already available for me and you. There's just that area of cooperation. Get in the cab. Get in that taxi. Quit looking at it. And get in. Cooperation. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, when you first meet someone, you don't know everything about them. <laughs> but the more you hang with one another, the more you, you know about them. Again, this is not about religion. It's about relationship. Religion is nothing but rituals. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. Verse 15, read it with me. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Dividing the word. Well, by dividing the word, you must know the word. Amen. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. Again, rightly dividing the word. You know, I get questions from people sometimes of, how do you know that's true? Especially when I go into the jails and minister and I share some revelations. Well, how, how did you get that? Well, it's in the Word. Well, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says, rightly divide the Word. You know what I tell them? Seek it out yourself. Search it. God is willing to give anything to anyone if they just become a seeker. There's something very important. He says, ask, seek, and knock. And you will what? Find him. If you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me, he says. But see, people don't want to seek with all their heart. They just want to give it to them. 
and it ain't gonna, that's not relationship. They will keep a person in a religious state. And they will never know him. They'll only know him by what they hear, but never meet him. And that's what the enemy wants to do. Again, just because God's used you doesn't mean you know him. I mean, even the word says that many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name. We did that. In your... And the Lord's going to say, I don't know you. Depart from me. Why? Because you practice lawlessness. Because if you knew me, you would have continued to seek me. You would have followed me. You would have obeyed me. And you'd stayed out of sin. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Let's speak it together. It says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning, what? Chose you. Chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Well, how are you going to believe in the truth if you don't read the Bible? Well, I don't believe the Bible, then you're lost. Then you don't know him and you won't. And you won't know what his promise is. You won't know what covenant is. You won't even know him. Amen? Verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Again, in this, he chose you. You didn't choose him. Now, after he chose you, we should want to choose him. Ephesians, three, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Building a relationship. One of the things that the <clears throat> enemy wants to do is breach your relationship with the Lord. He does that by multiple ways. He sets traps. He promotes pride. He brings influences and pushes. He knows what your weaknesses are. He knows what your thoughts are. Well, the devil can't read my thoughts. Oh, really? He's a spirit. All demons know what you think. They walk right through your body sometimes. You don't even know it. Or you may sense it. Sometimes you'll smell them. You'll sense them. You'll sense their fruits, their irritations. Oh, they know. In Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Let's read it together. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he what? Chose us where? In him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So he chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame in love. Having predestined us to the adoption of sons and daughters by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So you are already pre-accepted. 
you're already pre-approved. You were with him before the world began. You're already in him. Again, that's why we, we have this sensation of looking for something that feels good. Because we came from a presence that felt great. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And because that's where we came from, we have a tendency to always look for home again. And the enemy knows that because you know what? That's one of our weaknesses. We're always looking for home. So what he likes to do is put things across our path that make us feel good. That are counterfeit home, counterfeit presence. And what it does is then when that leaves, he comes in and begins to discourage, torment, oppress. And then people run to the world again looking for relief instead of going to God's presence. That's why addicts get high, because they're looking for God's presence. That's why shopaholics shop. They're looking for God's presence. That's why workaholics work constantly, because they're looking for fulfillment, but they're actually looking in God's presence. And then when people get enough money, then their fear is losing it. Because nothing replaces God's presence. Amen? <laughs> In 1 Peter chapter 2. Oh, hallelujah. Building a relationship. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4, something like that. It says, coming to him as to a what? Living stone rejected by men. You ever been rejected by men? Well, hallelujah. And we've burned enough bridges in our life. Rejected by men, but chosen by God. So even though we've been rejected because we've done some goofy stuff, we've hurt people, said things we shouldn't, done things we shouldn't, a man will say, get out of here. I never want to see you again. Don't want to know you again. Don't call me. But God always is there with open arms. I know they reject you. Come on. I'll take you in. Because his love is unconditional. His love for me and you is not dependent on your works or abilities. His love never changes. But his trust is different. He doesn't trust everyone. Does everybody get it? Because for you to get his trust, you got to know him. Because you won't trust someone you don't know. Amen? <laughs> so in this, he says, now, I know you've been rejected by men, but come to me. I, I've chosen you because you're precious. Verse 4, coming to him is a living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. Everyone say, I'm precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a what? Spiritual house. And a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Your spiritual sacrifices are your praise and worship. That's your spirit. People are going, oh, man, I sacrificed so much. Really? I haven't seen you sing in a while. Sacrifice. This is the altar now. You are the temple of God. Your lips and mouth is the altar of God. When you worship the Lord, you are giving up a sacrifice. It's called the sacrifice of praise. The only reason why you don't worship because you don't know. Why? Because you're not willing to humble yourself enough to get in his presence. 
and you'll be a bystander instead of a participator. It's like going to a football game. Man, people worship that pigskin. And these guys dressed in funny uniforms running up and down the court. They scream and yell, yeah, yeah. They get in God's presence. Far be it that they might sing to Jesus, the one that made them. <laughs> Worship a pig instead of the Lord. Verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, the elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to what? Shame. Why? Because you're following him. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. You know, God doesn't have to prove anything. He did already on the cross. It's already been proven. You know, people go, I don't believe in God. I tell them, well, what's the date? Well, 2015, B.C. or A.D.? A.D.? Well, where do you think that came from, dummy? Does everybody get it? I mean, the date even proves that there's a God, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because of the blinders. Therefore, you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone and the stone of stumbling block, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word. Well, how can you be obedient to the word if you don't know it? To which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Say, I'm his own special people. That you may proclaim the what? Praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people of God, but now are people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. When you cry out for mercy, what you're asking the Lord to do is consider you. Lord, have mercy on me. Consider me. And when he considers you, he releases grace, which is his plan. Now, you have a choice to cooperate with his plan or do your own. Amen? And I suggest that you cooperate with his plan because it's the only way out of here. <laughs> 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1. Let's speak it together. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called, what? Children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us. Why? Because they don't know him. And believe me, the more the, you know him, the world begins to lose you. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be what? Like him. Woohoo. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Here's the kicker. Are you ready? Verse 6. Read it with me. Whoever abides in him does not sin. So what is the key word? Abide. Abide. That's the key word. Abide. So how are you going to abide him? You're going to abide in him through praise and worship. You're going to abide in him through prayer and his word. And you're going to abide in him through fellowship, a 
assembling. Whoever abides in him doesn't sin. In other words, sin doesn't have dominion over him. He has a dominion over sin. He's not a partaker of darkness. He's an exposer of darkness. Because you hate darkness. You hate blindness. Does everybody understand that? You hate it. You don't love it. You don't pet it. You expose it. You hate it. Why? Because you love the light so much more because you're building a relationship. And anything that would interfere with your relationship with him, you don't want. You don't want it. You reject it. And when you reject those things, he accepts you. You've just proven to him something. See, one of the things that God does when he said to me one day, Guy, do you want to get off of drugs and alcohol, or do you want a new life? And I realized getting off the drugs and alcohol wasn't about it. I needed a new life because I tried already. And when I said, I want a new life, you know what he said to me? Show me. Show me. I thought, whoa, show you? And I did whatever I had to do. I shut the door to everything that I knew that was harmful to me. I shut the door to everything that I knew that was displeasing to him. And when I got out of detox, the first thing I did was throw all, went home and threw out the girl. And I didn't even know. I said, listen here, girl. Something ain't right here. And I don't know. I don't even know why this ain't right, but this ain't right. If you ain't my wife, this ain't right. You got to go. And I began to remove everything else that I knew was displeasing to God, even though I didn't know God yet. But there was something within me that was saying, know me. Why? Because no man comes to the Father unless you're drawn. So you can't even sit in this room right now unless God drew you. You had already been out the door. That's why we lock it. No. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Abide is the key, isn't it? Amen. Let's go to chapter 2 while we're here. And verse 3, it says, by this we know that we know him, if we what? Is anybody there? If we what? Keep his commandments. Now, people always look at the commandments as the Ten Commandments. His commandments are his, what he's asking you to do. You know, his commandments are already in you. They're already in your heart. You can obey those no matter what. That's a desire because it's in your heart, it's in your mind. His commandments, even the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's already in you. That's on, we already know that now. But then there's more. There's commands that he gives. But those commandments that he's also talking about is not doing those things that are displeasing to him. Verse 4, for he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Well, why isn't the truth in him? Because they never read the word. Or they don't practice it. But whoever keeps his word, hello, there's the answer. Truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are where? In him. Here we go again. And he who says he what? Abides in him, ought himself all to walk just as he walked. So in other words, we will have the same desires. 
will have compassion. We carry mercy. We carry grace. We carry all these things that he carries because he's in us. We shun evil. We don't associate with dirty jokes. We don't associate with lies. You know how many, too many believers go to these uh, places to uh, phone things and lie to make money. Marketing. Direct marketing. Now some of those are good. Some of them are lies. And it opens the door to their life. Why? Because they're they're justifying in their arena to make money. And it opens the door. Hello? And what happens is it contaminates their spirit then. To know him is to keep his command. You know, the Bible says that you and I, the saints, will judge the world. <laughs> the saints will judge the world. That's pretty wild, isn't it? So for you and I to be a good judge, we better be clean. We need to have the wisdom of God. We got to know him. He won't let someone judge that doesn't know him. Amen? Knowing him, abiding in him. Again, he chose us. We didn't choose him. Now, we choose him. That means we want to know him. Our relationship is in a constant building. We ever, you don't reach a place where it's done. Does everybody get it? You never reach a place where it's finished. When you reach a place where you think it's finished, you've fallen. It's not finished. We're always learning. Always learning who he is. He says something very powerful. He says in Matthew 7, I think it is. Go there, please. In verse 7, it says what? Ask and it what? Will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be what? Open. Or what man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then be an evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law of the prophets. Enter in by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in it that way. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it, or who are willing to pay the price. Amen? John 10. John chapter 10. And you know, the word tells us, don't worry about what you're going to wear, about what you're going to eat. About what you're going to be. Don't worry. Stay abiding. His will begins to unfold. Don't worry. Worry is fear. Fear is a spirit. Just brings more torment. Amen. John chapter 10. Is everybody there in verse 22? It said, now it was a feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple, and Solomon's approached. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? They were bl blaming Jesus for keeping them in doubt. If you are Christ, tell us plainly. 
Jesus answered, I told you, and you don't believe, he said to them. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. Snap. <laughs> Snap and slap. <laughs> Verse 27, my sheep what? Hear my voice. And I know them and they what? Follow me. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. Oh, hallelujah. And they shall never perish. We're going to never perish, you know. As long as you stay in the light, you won't perish. If you walk in the dark, you definitely will. Because you know what? When you walk in the dark, you instantly perish. You disappear, don't you? When the lights go out, no one can see. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Jesus was expressing who he was. They still didn't get it because they chose not to believe. Again, you have the power to choose. You can choose to believe or reject. God will not force you, and he doesn't have to prove anything to me and you. He already has. That's why the word says, grow in the grace of God. Go to Proverbs 3. Starting at verse 1, would you read it with me? My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and men. Wow. Trust in the Lord with what? All of your heart. Again, you won't trust someone you don't know. You won't trust that he's faithful. You won't trust that he can provide. You won't trust to wait. See, the enemy likes you to grab hold of the first thing that seems good instead of wait for the best perfect trust in the Lord with all of your heart and what lean not on your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path that doesn't mean you're going to understand it all amen you just got to trust it your relationship with him is trust and how are you going to build that trust confession Reading, speaking the word, reading the word, reading the promises of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. Does everybody understand that? Go to John 16. In verse 7. Uh, verse 12, I'm sorry. Verse 12, John 16, verse 12. Jesus is speaking. And he says in verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, they won't understand it yet. However, when he, the spirit of truth, who is the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. When the spirit of truth has come, he will what? Guide you into what? All truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to what? Come. Hmm. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. 
That's relationship. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take a, what's mine and declare it to you. So let me share with you. Relationship with God cannot be established without the Holy Spirit. Other than that, it's just stinking religion. It's like reading a Sports Illustrated, knowing about someone but never meeting them. Only the Holy Spirit can bring the reality of who God is because he is his spirit. Relationship with the Holy Spirit is the main building part of your relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit. Has everybody got it? Why? Because he's the one that's going to bring you understanding, isn't he? He's the one that's going to guide you. He's the one that's going to interpret the word to you. He is not only the spirit of God. He carries, he is the anointing of God, the eternal presence, power, and truth of God. He's your nanny. He's your everything. I'm telling you, every morning, when I was first born again in the spirit, it was like he would come in and take me by the hand every morning, and we'd go. We'd go to the throne room. He'd come and take me by the hand. We'd go do wherever. Where are we going today? Come on, let's get in the car. Wherever. Me and Buddy were tight. We'd go wherever. He's still there. I still have to invite him every morning. Because I'm an idiot right out of them. I can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. He brings the Father real to me. He's the one that opens that realm. He's the one that says, pray in the Spirit, man. He's the one that convicts. He will tell us all things. Now, we've gone through all of this building a relationship for a specific purpose. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Hallelujah. Book of Daniel, chapter 12. Building a relationship. Why? It's essential. In verse 1, it says, And at that time, Michael, the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. There will be a what? Time of trouble such as never was seen there was a nation. Even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is what? Found written in the book of life. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting content or damnation. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. In other words, understanding shall increase. Why? Because we are at the end. We're at the end. We are in the end time. Israel became a nation in 1948. He said that generation will by no means pass by that the Lord will not return. He will come. We are in the end times and it is essential that you and I have a relationship, a building relationship and continuous so that we are closer and closer to him. Why? Because he is releasing understanding of what is going on to those who are close to him. Why? So we can share and guide others. 
But first you must get your house in order. This must get in order. And then your house in order. You cannot say one thing and do another. Amen? It's sealed for the end time. Understanding is being released to guide others. It is here now. It says, verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this river bank and another on the other river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man called on Linda, Linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. That's three and a half years. That's during tribulation. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Daniel was given a visitation, a prophetic revelation that he didn't even know or understand. He spoke it and wrote it. The book of Daniel was written in 550 B.C. And we're, since 1948, things have been released. Since Israel became a nation, God has begun to release understanding of the times and the seasons and the things that is going on because we are in the last days. And he said in verse 10, he said, Many shall be purified, made white, and refined, but the wicked shall be do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise will understand. Does everybody get it? The wise will what? Understand. That's why we're getting more and more understanding of end time prophecies. That's why we're seeing, it says, in the days of Noah shall, shall it be. That's why there's understanding of the Nephilim. All of these things that are being released of understanding, the giants and all the other things, uh, the DNA structures and the change. All of these things are being released with understanding to those who are close. Go to Proverbs 3. Proverbs chapter 3. And verse 31. Proverbs 3, 31. What does it say? Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. But his secret counsel is with the what? Upright. In other words, he's going to release understanding and reveal things of end time prophecies. He said, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful. He gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. So we see that the secret counsel is given to those who are close to the Lord. And Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verse 12. Would you read it with me, please? Who is the man that what? Fears the Lord. Him shall he teach in a way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and the descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with what? Those who fear him, those who reverence him, honor him, who seek him, who respect him, who go after him. He shall show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net that the enemy snares. 
And I'm going to close at Psalm 16. Building a relationship. Letters to the churches. Everything was a, an expression and an encouragement of building a relationship. Psalm 16, in verse 7. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall what? Never be moved. So relationship building is always having the Lord set before you. If the Lord is not before you, there's no relationship. So no matter what you're doing, he's always there. He's always there before you. You're always acknowledging him. So that when you are impressed to sin, you see him. When you don't see him, then you've stepped away from your relationship. Does everybody get it? I always set the, listen, you won't set the Lord before you because you want to do something that's displeasing to him. That's not relationship. So what you're willing to do is break your relationship with the Lord because you want to do what you want. So you'll put him aside, although you can't put him aside. He sees it all, knows all. It's amazing, like, when people close their doors and they think nobody's watching. But let me tell you, if you have a relationship, he's there. If you don't, you just ignore him. And when you ignore him, he'll ignore you. When you deny him, he'll deny you. Amen? Amen? Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. Why? Because I set him before me. Because I desire to have a relationship. I'm not going to ignore his counsel, his conviction. Amen. You shall show me the path of life and in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. Amen. But it means when we do make a mistake, forgive me, Dad. Sorry, you know, I shouldn't have done that. You repent quickly and get back in divine order. divine order, building a relationship. You have a desire to know him, to please him, and to set him before you. You want to know the truth. And in so doing that, he begins to reveal things, hidden mysteries. Your experiences with him begin to increase. Visitations, dreams, visions, other things, things that you don't even have to ask for, and he does it. Because one of the things he wants to do is make himself real to you. Because his love for me and you, he was willing to die for. Amen? Amen. And he has. And he's risen again. And he's granted me and you to be with him forever. So since we're going to be with him forever, it's good to know him. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And listen, he wants to give us the understanding because there are so many people that don't know. When things are, look, at there are things that are happening right now that even people that are so-called believers don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going on. They have no idea. They're still voting for people and putting them in office that are heathen, evil. It's amazing. They put 
bumper stickers on their cars that say one name that's a wicked person and a fish on the other side. I'm like, what the heck? They got no idea. They got Obamanite and a fish. That ain't right. Those are two opposites. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Building a relationship. Remember, he's our dad, and he wants us as his children, first of all. It's not what you can do for him, but what he's already done. Amen? Be his child, then his steward. Earn trust. Know him. Praise God. Father, we are honored and we are blessed. And we welcome you to continue to reveal yourself to us, to increase our faith, to increase our knowledge of you, and to increase our love for you. Keep us hidden in you, Lord, according to your word. And open our eyes to see who you are, our ears to hear your voice, and our hearts to follow you all the days of our life that we may express you with understanding and guide others to your presence. In Jesus' name.